Hey kids, um, Star Girl by Jerry Spinelli. We are on chapter 27. Let's read. And our best wishes go with you, Susan Carraway. The PA announcement echoed through the school lobby and we were off to Phoenix. The driver was Mr. McShane, Mika High's faculty representative to the state contest. Susan and I sat in the back. Susan's parents were driving their own car and would meet us in Phoenix. As we pulled out of the parking lot, she wagged a finger in my face. Don't get a big head, mister. I was allowed to invite two friends along. You weren't the only one, I asked. So who was the other, I said. Dory. Well then, I said, I think I'll go for the big head. Dory isn't another guy. She grinned. No, she's not one of those. Suddenly, she unbuckled her seatbelt. We each had a back window. Mr. McShane, she announced, I'm moving over so I can sit close to Leo. He's so cute, I can't help myself. In the rear view mirror, the teacher's eyes crinkled. Whatever you'd like, Susan, it's your day. She slid over and fastened herself into the middle belt. She jabbed me. Hear that? It's my day. I get whatever I want. So, I said, what happened when you asked Dory Dilson? She said no. She's mad at me. I could tell. Ever since I became Susan, she thinks I betrayed myself. She just doesn't understand how important it is to be popular. I wasn't sure, sure what to say to that. I was feeling a little uneasy. Fortunately, wondering what to say wasn't much of a problem for me during that two hour ride because Susan chatted away like the old star girl the whole time. But I know Dory, she said. I'll tell you one thing. What's that? She'll be in the front of the mob cheering for me when we get back tomorrow. I later found out that after we left the school, the principal had spoken again on the PA. He announced our expected time of return on Saturday and suggested that everyone be on hand to meet us, win or lose. Losing, as it turned out, never occurred to the contestant herself. Would you do me a favor, she said. I told her, sure. The big silver plate that goes to the winner, I'm such a klutz with dishes at home. Would you hold it for me when the crowd rushes us? I'm afraid I'll drop it. I stared at her. What crowd? What rush? In the school parking lot, when we get back tomorrow, there's always a crowd waiting for the returning hero. Remember the film at school? My vision? She cocked her head and peered into my eyes. She wrapped my forehead with her knuckle. Hello in there. Anybody home? Oh, I said, that crowd. She nodded. Exactly. Of course. We'll be safe as long as we're in the car. But once we get out, who knows what will happen? Crowds can get pretty wild. Right, Mr. McShane? The teacher nodded. So I hear. She spoke to me as if instructing a first grader. Leo, this has never happened to Mika before, having a winner of the Arizona State Oratorical Contest, one of their very own. When they hear about it, they're going to go bananas. And when they get a gander at me and that trophy, she rolled her eyes and whistled. I just hope they don't get out of hand. The police will keep them in line, I said. Maybe they'll call out the National Guard. <coughs> she stared wide-eyed. You think? She didn't realize I was kidding. Well, she said, I'm really not afraid for myself. I won't mind a little jostling. Do you think they'll jostle, Mr. McShane? In the mirror, his eyes shifted to us. Never can tell. And if they want to carry me around on their shoulders, that's okay too. But they better not. She poked at me with her finger. Better not mess with my trophy. That's what... That's why you, another poke, are going to hold it tight. I wished Mr. McShane would say something. Susan, I said, did you ever hear of counting your chickens before they hatch, you mean? Exactly. I hear you're not supposed to. Exactly. She nodded thoughtfully. Never made much sense to me. I mean, if you know they're going to hatch, why not count them? Because you can't know, I said. There are no guarantees. I hate to break it to you, but you're not the only person in the contest. Somebody else could win. You could lose. It's possible. She thought about that for a moment, then shook her head. Nope, not possible, so. She threw up her arms and smiled hugely. 
Why wait to feel great? Celebrate now, that's my motto. She nuzzled into me. What's yours, big boy? Don't count your chickens, I said. She shuddered mockingly. Oh, you're such a poop, Leo. What's your motto, Mr. McShane? Drive carefully, he said. You may have a winner in the car. That set her off, howling. Mr. McShane, I said, you're not helping. Sorry, he lied. I just looked at her. You're going to be in a state contest, I said. Aren't you just a little bit nervous? She, the smile vanished. Yes, I am. I'm a lot nervous. I just hope things don't get out of hand when we get back to the school. I've never been adored by mobs of people before. I'm not sure how I'm going to react. I hope I don't get a big head. Do you think I'm the big head type, Mr. McShane? I raised my hand. Can I answer that? I think your head is just fine, said the teacher. She jabbed me with her elbow. Hear that, Mr. Know-it-all? She gave me her smug face, which promptly disappeared as she thrust up her arms and yelped. They're going to love me! Mr. McShane wagged his head and chuckled. Silently, I gave up. She pointed out the window. Look, even the desert is celebrating. It seemed to be true. The normally dull cacti and scrub were splashed with April colors, as if a great painter had passed over the landscape with a brush, dabbing yellow here and red there. Susan strained against her seatbelt. Mr. McShane, can we stop here for just a minute, please? When the teacher hesitated, she added, You say it's my day. I get whatever I want. The car coasted to a stop along the gravelly roadside. In the moment, in a moment, she was out the door and bounding across the desert. She skipped and whirled and cartwheeled among the prickly natives. She bowed to a yucca, waltzed with a saguaro. She plucked a red blossom from a barrel cactus and fixed it in her hair. She practiced her smile and her nod and her wave, one hand, two hands, and the adorning mob at her hero's welcome. She snapped a needle from a cactus and with a, the slapstick pantomime of a circus clown pretended to pick her teeth with it. Mr. McShane and I were leaning on the car laughing when suddenly she stopped, cocked her head, and stared off in another direction. She stayed like that, stone still, for a good two minutes, then abruptly turned and came back to the car. Her face was thoughtful. Mr. McShane, she said as the teacher drove off, do you know of any extinct birds? Passenger pigeon, he said. That's probably the best known. They say there used to be so many of them they would darken the sky when they flew over and the moa. Moa? Huge bird, like a condor, I said. He chuckled. A condor wouldn't come up to its knee, make an ostrich look small. 12, 13 feet tall, maybe the biggest bird ever. Couldn't fly, lived in New Zealand, died out 100 years ago, killed off by people. Half their size, said Susan. Mr. McShane nodded. Hmm, I wrote a report about moas in grade school. I thought they were the neatest thing. Susan's eyes were glistening. Did moas have a voice? The teacher thought about it. I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows. Susan looked out the window at the passing desert. I heard a mockingbird back there, and it made me think of something Archie said. Mr. Brubaker, said Mr. McShane. Yes, he said he believes mockingbirds may do more than imitate other birds. I mean, other living birds. He thinks they may also imitate the sounds of birds that, no long, that are no longer around. He thinks the sound of extinct birds are passed down from years from mockingbird to mockingbird. Interesting thought, said Mr. McShane. He says when a mockingbird sings, for all we know, it's pitching fossils into the air. He says, who knows what songs of ancient creatures we may be hearing out there. The words of Archie Brubaker settled over the silence of the car. As if reading my thoughts, Mr. McShane turned off the air conditioner and powered down the windows. Hair blew in a faint, smoky scent of mesquite. After a while, I felt the touch of Susan's hands. Her fingers wove through mine. Mr. McShane, she cooed, we're holding hands in the back seat. Uh-oh, he said, hormonal teenagers. Don't you think he's cute, Mr. McShane? 
I never really thought about it, said the teacher. Well, look, she said. She grabbed my face in her hands and pulled it forward. The teacher's eyes considered me briefly in the rearview mirror. You're right. He's adorable. Susan, releasing my blushing face, told you, don't you just love him? I wouldn't go that far. A minute later, Mr. McShane, I felt something in my ear. I'm putting my finger in his ear. This sort of silliness went on until we rounded a mesa and saw the brown mist on the horizon that announced our approach to the city of Phoenix.